I've been asked to say a few words on the challenges in the global business sector. This is a, a sector which started in 1992 and uh, has been growing year after year. Okay, so I have summarized a list of challenges, the most important ones, of course. And uh, so let's get started. So the, the challenges I believe that we should cover uh, should be the perception of Mauritius, the level of uncertainty, not only in Mauritius but in the world, the declining importance of tax, substance, which is a key word in our sector today, and gift. Well, some of you know what is gift. I'm going to tell you afterwards what the real meaning of gift means. And of course, I will add a few words in terms of uh, the way ahead, what we can do to mitigate uh, the, the impact of those challenges. So we start with the perception of Mauritius. We had a number of leaks. Okay, we're not talking about, you know, water leaks, but leaks of confidential information uh, in the internet. So uh, the latest one you probably heard is a Mauritius leaks. Mauritius leaks came out because uh, probably the server of one of the service providers in Mauritius was hacked and information was disseminated all across the world uh, on the internet. The previous leaks were the Paradise leaks, the Paradise Papers, Panama Papers, Swiss leaks, so we're, not, we're now part of a global phenomenon. Okay? What the Mauritius leaks uh, brought is an unprecedented level of negative press. Uh, so we had very bad press, both locally and intentionally, uh, it, uh, it also uh, brought the authorities in Mauritius to try to, to sort of justify why the global business sector was important. The private sector also played uh, an important role in trying to fan off those attacks. We also have the populist movement, okay? Uh, well, in Europe you have the Gilets Jaunes, in Hong Kong you have the pro-democracy. Uh, protesters. So what this has to do with uh, all the leaks and all the pressure is that it's sort of uh, fueling the, uh, the, uh, a lot of, uh, the, you know, population are angry and uh, these are being fueled through, uh, you know, the gilets jaunes, uh, the uh, protesters in Hong Kong. And the impact is that it is distorting policy making. Distorting policy making because uh, bodies like the OECD, uh, European Union, uh, will take into account what population are thinking, and hence any measures that they take are not necessarily rational measures, okay? More emotional measures. What we can also see is uh, an overemphasis. Uh, focus of regulators on offshore. So meaning that the traditional offshore centers like Channel Islands, Isle of Man, the Caribbean, uh, you will see the OECD and EU tend to attack those jurisdictions more than the traditional onshore jurisdiction. Okay, so what happened is uh, uh, you, you have a jurisdiction like London, of course. Um, you also have jurisdiction like Singapore and Hong Kong, and also in the US. Uh, you probably heard about states like Delaware, Nevada, Wyoming. I mean, those centers are booming. They are booming because they're onshore. Okay? So what we have now is a new phenomenon. It's called a new onshore. The new onshore means clients want to avoid 
reputational risk. Clients want to make sure that whatever happened in the future don't get leaked in the press. So if they are located in a new onshore jurisdiction, it makes them safer. Okay? So we are being faced with that problem. Every day we have clients asking us, okay, we want to redomicile to the UK, we want to redomicile to Singapore. So those are the problems that we're facing. In a survey, more than 20% of companies surveyed will stop using IFCs in the future. The way ahead. Global business must be more visible in Mauritius. It's important that the public knows what this sector is contributing. This sector has brought a lot of expertise, a lot of wealth to Mauritians. Okay? In the traditional manufacturing sector, let's say the textile sector, you probably need a whole family to work in that factory to feed that family. In the financial services sector, the contrary. You have a graduate, he alone can feed his family. So it's a very high, uh, high reward uh, sector. We need to protect that sector. It's important that global business makes itself known better to the local press. Of course, the offshore tech sector has been operating as an offshore sector since 1992, and it's been very difficult to integrate both sectors. But hopefully, because of pressure uh, from elsewhere, it is becoming inevitable that both sectors will converge in the future. My next, the next challenge I see is an unprecedented, unprecedented level of uncertainty. Okay. Well, I think by the end of today, you will know all the acronyms existing in the offshore world, starting with the OECD, EU, ISAMLAG, BEPS, MLI, CRS, FATCA, you know, all the acronyms means uh, something important, okay? But more and more, uh, we have uncertainties because a lot of new rules, a lot of new laws are being introduced. Treaties are being changed at the stroke of a pen Okay, uh, and of course, goalposts are moving all the time. Okay, so we recently had the blacklist uh, or the grey list of the EU. Okay, uh, the Fifty Shades of the EU blacklist. This is not a movie. This is the title of our, of our newsletter. Okay, we published a newsletter in March this year because, uh, well, following the European Union rejection of the European Commission list of blacklist countries. So the EC, the European Commission came up with 25 countries uh, that were supposed to be blacklisted and they were rejected by the European Union. Uh, the European Union said that the list was not established in a transparent and resilient process that actively incentivizes affected countries to take decisive action while also respecting their right to be heard. And it is saying that in the direction of the European Commission. Okay? So the revised list, of course, did not include a lot of important countries. Okay? So for me, there's no level playing field anymore. The level playing field that we've been promised by the OECD in 1999, for me, is gone. We have to fight by ourselves. We have to make sure that we don't rely on other states to get any benefit or you know, uh, disadvantage. We also have a change in fiscal regime. So what we've done is, uh, because of the pressure of the European Commission, we have abolished the 80% deemed credit that we used to have in our income tax law. And uh, 
This has affected a lot of business in Mauritius because uh, the new system that has been introduced, a partial exemption method, has still to prove itself. Okay? And still, we're well, not out of the woods yet because the EU has still to give its final go ahead on that new system. And also, in uh, 2021, the grandfathering for the existing companies are going away. So in June 2021, all the companies will revert to the new system of partial exemption. So it is going to be a very uncertain, 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 sorry, uncertain world in Mauritius. The way ahead, I think we need to be smarter. It's smarter when we negotiate. Okay. So if someone says jump, we don't jump twice as high. Okay, we just need to look at what other people are doing and try to manage the expectation better. Now, tax. Tax is taboo now. You know, a few years ago, a client would say, okay, I would like to to have some tax planning done. Tax avoidance is legal. Okay, but now even the mention of tax make it immoral. So we have a problem because we are a tax treaty jurisdiction. Okay? Where will it stop? I'll give you one example. Can you imagine how many of you have bought any duty free items in their life? All of you. Can you imagine one day you go to an African country, you go to their duty free shop, and you bought and you buy a bottle of Johnny Walker, and somebody accuses you of tax evasion, and he tells you that because you bought that bottle of duty free whiskey, you are depriving the Africans of the tax revenue. I mean, this is a sort of uh, argument that, you know, uh, that the ICIJ, which is a consortium of journalists, are using to try to, to get uh, support from the uh, general population. Okay. So tax, at the stroke of a pen, through the OECD multilateral instrument, all the tax treaties that have been signed are changed straight away. So the MLI, we call it the multilateral instrument, introduces the concept of principal purpose test in all DTAs, meaning that if one of the purpose of you setting up a Mauritius structure is to pay less tax, it's going to be disallowed. Okay. So there's going to be a lot of uh, arguments with the tax officers. The other issue we had, sharing of tax rights, taxing rights. We had a few changes in treaties, India to start with, Rwanda, Senegal. Of course, each country, depending on the stage of development, need a different type of treaty. Some countries are looking for FDI, they are not looking for tax revenue. Tax revenue will come way down the line. When India was identified by Mauritius for investment in 1992, India was not looking for tax revenue. They were looking for FDI. Same for African countries. But at one point in time, of course, those countries will say, okay, I have now reached a certain level of development and now want to focus on tax collection. I believe Mauritius will then be or should sit down with their counterparts and renegotiate treaties because it's also it's, it's, it's fair to share the taxing rights. So tax is no longer a major motivator to set up a Mauritius structure. What we need to emphasize now is the other benefits of using Mauritius. Okay? The 
the additional non-tax benefits. Okay, you use Mauritius, you can get residence here. You use Mauritius, you can live here. Uh, you use Mauritius, we, have, we don't have exchange controls. Okay, we have investment protection agreements to protect your investments. So all those non-tax factors become more and more important. Okay, and it's important for government to also step in and improve those non-tax benefits. I'm going to talk about substance because substance is going to be a major topic in the next few years. I don't know whether you've heard about SIGA, it's another acronym, it's called Core Income Generating Activity. So the Core Income Generating Activity must be in Mauritius. Okay? So a lot of the services that are being provided uh, by the Mauritius companies are being outsourced right now. Okay? But all this is changing for certain services like you know, investment funds, CIS manager, investment advisors. They all need to be present on the island. They all need to recruit, to employ people, and have minimum expenditure in Mauritius. Okay? I mean, for example, the law just came out for a Freeport company. Uh, you need to have a minimum of $100,000, uh, 3.5 million uh, minimum expenditure and employ five Lo uh, people locally. Okay, so this is not only in Mauritius but worldwide. But this is an opportunity for Mauritius because in Mauritius we have the land, we have the space, we have the resources, we have the human resource available. Can you imagine if we were doing that in an island like Jersey where, you know, the number of unemployed people probably about 120, okay? So there are people who can be employed here. I think Mauritius has one of the highest number of chartered accountants per square foot in the world. Okay, in that room, in this room, I, I already see so many fellow chartered accountants. So it's relatively easy to employ people in Mauritius. So that could turn into our advantage. Okay. The way ahead, of course, is to beef up local substance, make sure that we comply with those laws and regulations. We also need to ascertain what are the competencies that we need. Okay? And it's important to ascertain those competencies because we can then uh, have an immigration policy that is based on the competency shortage. The last challenge I will talk about is GIFT. This is not a GIFT. This stands for Gujarat International Financial Tech City. Okay? Now, I don't know how many of you were around back in 1992 when the offshore sector started. But India always wanted to set up an offshore center in India. Mumbai, or Bombay as it was then called, was earmarked back in the 1990s to be the offshore center for India. So India always had this in mind. Okay? So following our change in the DTA with India, Gujarat appeared, and this appears to be a threat to Mauritius because they are going to do the same thing that we used to do, except that they are being given 10-year tax holiday and many more benefits. Okay, this is going to be the only place in India which allow offshore transaction. So is it the nail in the coffin for the Mauritius IFC as, as far as India is concerned? Well, I can already tell you very few businesses going to India use Mauritius nowadays. Okay, you look at the statistics at the FSC, the number of incorporations for companies and funds going to India has fallen drastically. Okay. So, the way ahead, what can we gain from GIFT? The authorities in Mauritius are negotiating passporting, meaning that entities registered in Mauritius will be able to operate in India without having to re register themselves. 
but we need to be aware of any reciprocity just to make sure that there's no back door open for other operators to come and uh, challenge us in what we're doing. So that's the list of the few challenges that I've identified. Um, if you have any questions, more than happy to answer them. Thank you. Ben, Ben, please, please, please stay on stage till we. So Ben, one question I have is, uh, how long will jurisdictions that have zero tax be able to carry on? Like Seychelles, BVI, Cayman, how long can they carry on having a zero tax regime and living with it as well? Well, I think zero tax is not a problem if you don't have tax in your uh, system. So, okay, uh, I think what is a problem is uh, the ring fencing. So if you have, uh, normally you have a 15% rate, and then for certain companies, you ring fence them, and you don't tax uh, those, those companies. So in those circumstances, I believe there will be a convergence uh, in terms of uh, taxation. Uh, they, they would expect that you either reduce your, your tax, or you get rid of this uh, that, that zero tax. Thank you. Do you have any more questions for Ben? Ben, to just rejoin what uh, Ravneet was talking about, I mean, the question that he asked you, my question is a variant on the same topic. As we all know that there's been uh, all these places like Jersey, Guernsey, Caymans, together with Mauritius, they have been forced to introduce Bahamas as well, substance conditions. As you rightly said, it's so much more difficult for these places to employ people and to bring about those substance. Now, the question is again the same. What do you think would be the impact of the introduction of such substance conditions on these uh, rock islands or other offshore jurisdictions uh, as compared to Mauritius, let's say? I think the substance requirement only impact a certain categories of companies. So companies that are regulated as financial services companies, so investment funds, advisors, uh, administrators, so those, those businesses will be the first impacted. Okay, so investment holding companies which form the majority of the companies in Mauritius and also in those jurisdiction, for the time being, there's no substance requirement in terms of employment for those companies. But yes, there's about, as you know, about, what, over 200,000? Yes. Of, of this, a lot of funds and all that are in Caymans. Yes. Uh, they will definitely get impacted by all this. Yes. Uh, if we bring about what the government introduced, well, intended to introduce in the budget, which I believe the FS is still working on, on the amendment to the special purpose fund to bring about a new product in Mauritius, maybe we could catch some of these businesses where we could have more substance here? Well, I think there's a lot of opportunities of uh, looking for businesses that will discontinue in, in certain places. It could be from the Cayman, or nowadays it could on, uh, also be from Hong Kong. You know, we've been getting requests for businesses to resettle out of Hong Kong because of the uprising in Hong Kong. So whatever happens in terms of the economics, there are free movement of those entities. I agree with you. Maybe a last, last comment. I, I just traveled back from, from India uh, just a couple of weeks ago, and uh, I discussed this gift. And as we all know, all the new tax breaks that the government of India has introduced in, in, uh, you know, in the gift uh, which makes it even a better place than what Mauritius has ever been from a tax point of view. Now, what the uh, leading lawyers, the, the few of them that I met, what they were telling me is uh, the government has already, the government of India has already removed the requirement for filing tax returns. Now they're considering even dropping a PAN requirement. Now, once they do that, if they do that, it will even give a further boost to the, the gift city but moreover, what Ben was talking about, in the olden days from the uh, 1990s, 
government of India wanted to have Bombay as the financial center. It never worked for many reasons. But now that they've acquired the expertise, the skills, although it's not fully operational at gift level, what I'm told is that they are considering to come back to Bombay and replicate it not only there, in several of the major centers, Hyderabad, uh, Bangalore, and all these places. Now, with the Modi government, if they are able to go to Mars and the moon, gift is nothing. And going back to Mumbai and trying to get it done, I think they will do it sooner or later. So uh, it's a space that we need to watch. Yes, Sunil. Ben, uh, I've got two questions for you. Uh, first one is the recent blueprint uh, uh, has set itself uh, as objective to double the contribution of the international financial center to GDP uh, by 2030, which means that uh, this sector would have to grow by an annualized rate of 6% during the next uh, 12 years, okay, to achieve that. So amid the world of uncertainty that you've described, where do you see that growth coming from? That's the first question. Second, uh, the blueprint also mentions that for this sector to achieve that kind of growth, we would have to move up the value chain in terms of products and services that Mauritius offers. So where do you see that opportunity in terms of higher value-add services? And what are some of the constraints that we would have to face in order to be able to really move up the value chain? Thank you, Sunila. I, I do believe that it's possible to, to achieve those objectives. Uh, you know, we need new tools. We need new products, okay? The government already started by, by um, by introducing REITs in, uh, in Mauritius in the last budget speech. Uh, Kamal talked about the special purpose fund. Okay, we have the wealth management umbrella license. Okay, so all those licenses, all those products are the new generation products. And I believe this will help us diversify away and also move up the value chain because we will need fund managers here in Mauritius. Uh, and because, of course, because of SIGA, you won't be able to outsource it elsewhere. So uh, we need expertise here. So it has to go hand in hand with the facilities that we offer in Mauritius, whether it's going to be educational facilities, uh, medical uh, facilities for expat. We will need people in Mauritius. Uh, and frankly speaking, 1.3 million uh, population, we can afford to have more people driving uh, this segment of the economy. Hi, Ben. Um, I completely agree with you. I think we need to move the discussion away from being a tax discussion to the non-tax benefits of Mauritius. Um, and I've already seen it with, 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 with Hong Kong, like what you're saying. A lot of people are really anxious about the Hong Kong uh, sort of geopolitical situation. We're seeing a lot of inquiries into Mauritius in terms of people who want to sort of uh, re-domicile. Uh, but I think there's a bigger play that we are not talking about, which is the Africa Free Trade uh, Continental Agreement which has just been signed a couple of months ago, which in effect creates the largest free trade body outside the WTO in terms of member states, right? And Africa's 2.4 trillion economy and said to be 3.6 in, in the next um, sort of decade. Um, and I believe Mauritius is actually very well placed to be you know, an, a fulcrum in terms of that sort of flow because we are a member of you know, the Africa Free Trade, we are members of COMESA, we're members of SADC, and I think that should probably be much more of a talking point than, than the tax issue. Absolutely, I agree with you. I also agree that uh, you know, the India SECPA, which has been in discussion for many years now, uh, uh, I hope this agreement gets signed as soon as possible because this will provide a lot of, I would say, a, a boost, a much needed boost to Mauritius. Okay, well, uh, let's give Ben a round of applause. Ben, thank you very much. Thank you.